So our presentation this evening is from our very own Al Margolis, club member. He's going to be talking about uh, computer vision. And at this point, I will turn it over to Al. Okay. Um, my name is Al Margolis, and I don't really know what I'm doing. I used to do lots of presentations. Um, the last one was about 30 years ago, using a Kodak carousel. Um, times have changed. Yeah, times, times have changed. Um, I don't know how to change slides. I was doing uh, real-time programming in the early 70s, 70 foot long robots that process checks at about 70 miles an hour. Um, you know, I, I've been working in the unix -E world in C since the mid-70s, you know, the transition from System 3 to System 5, if any of you remember that. Um, network and communication stuff, personal computers. I believe the first IBM PC to arrive in San Francisco was carried straight to my desk phone company, uh, microcontrollers, you know, basically whatever is new I'm, I'm working on. I've got no attention span for old stuff. Um, you know, where are we in hobby robotics? You know, it is amazing what has happened over the last, you know, five years. Um, you know, over the last 15 years. You know, a while back I was, uh, Dave Calkins, you know, who's god of robo games, he used to run the San Francisco robot group. And he would hardly let you in the door if you weren't willing to solder, um, which was kind of bad marketing, but you know, kind of practical in the day. You want to build anything, you know, you, you had to become a machinist, um, you know, and the hard way. You know, at that point, CNC was a little bit rare. Uh, you know, somewhere, you know, 15 or so years ago, you know, out came the Bobot, which was the first, you know, kind of packaged thing. You bought, you know, I sold a lot of Bobots. Um, and the thing that was nice about the box, here is one box. Here is everything you need. Every part. You've got a complete book explaining the whole thing. You can learn a whole bunch of stuff. Never regret selling it, you know, but it's so passe. You know, what can you do with the Bobot? Follow a little line. Um, and our capabilities, you know, are so much beyond that now, it's kind of nuts. You couldn't have built a couple years ago. You know, we've got 3D printers, you know, that let you custom build all sorts of stuff, you know, in your living room, you know, with a $500 machine, or you can send it off the Thingiverse and get it for 15 bucks in a couple days. Um, you know, we've got amazingly low-cost network computers. Um, we've got just all these great sensors, you know, as opposed to, you know, that they're, you all have our complaints, or, you know, they're crappy in their little ways, uh, but, uh, you know, we would have had the same bad sensors, you know, 15 years ago, but they cost $30,000 instead of 30 bucks. Uh, and batteries, you know, have again, you know, enabled all sorts of cool stuff that we couldn't do very long ago. Um, you know, why vision? You know, it's because it's the hard thing to build a little line following robot as a dumb line following robot, you know, it's too easy. Um, you know, it's too easy for us, it's too easy for the kids even, I think. You know, they want things that are harder, you know. Um, vision is potentially, you know, the universal sensor. Um, you can use it for lo localization, you know, you can use it for odometry, um, obstacle avoidance. You know, I can look out the window and have a fair idea what the temperature is, you know. Someday our robots will be able to do that too. Um, you know, potentially they're the most accurate sensor. You know, we all have experienced these problems with GPS and compasses and whatnot. You know, the, the bot's eyes don't lie. Your eyes don't lie, you know. And to the degree they do lie, they lie less than most other sensors you can find. I mean, can I assume that everybody here knows the Raspberry Pi and the general capabilities? Um, you know, so, you know, the big thing about the Raspberry Pi is for 50 bucks you can get a real computer that you're willing to put on a robot that you send in through the woods. Um, uh, and there's a huge source, you know, body of information behind it. The community is what makes it unique. Anybody, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of Raspberry Pi-ish things. Some much cheaper, some much faster. 
Uh, but the pie is in the sweet spot of capability, cost, and support. You can get help for whatever questions come along. Uh, you know, what about the Arduino? You know, the Arduinos become the easy thing. You know, you still need them. At Robo Games, you know, almost every robot that I looked at had a pie in the middle and was surrounded by all these other boards, you know, sometimes multiple Arduino-ish things. You need them for five uh, volts. You need them for certain sorts of real-time operations. Um, uh, but, you know, it's kind of boring now. We, we, we know all of that stuff. Uh, if you mainly want to learn electronics, it's probably still a good starting platform. If you just want to build higher level things and focus on the programming, um, it's probably a secondary interest now. Uh, how do I get my kids started? This is a question I've been answering for about 20 years. The answer is grab a shovel and start digging. Um, you know, there is no path, you know, um, and it keeps getting harder and harder. You know, we, we have these greater tools, but they're more complicated. Um, uh, so you can, you know, there are a million ways to get started, and I have no idea what the best is, and there probably isn't the best. Um, I, how, what time is it on the clock? Sorry, it's working, so not that bad. Uh, I want to be done by nine, um, uh, just for the sake of everybody else. Uh, I can talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, uh, you know, how to get started, um, Okay, so my one of the things started, you know, was I think in January, Osmond sent out the email, you know, last minute we may not have a speaker who has something to say, and at that point I had that beginner's enthusiasm. I had just gotten into OpenCV, I was doing this really cool stuff, and I said, well, I can talk about that. Um, you know, since then, several competitions, you know, hundreds of hours of software development later, you know, my, my energy level and my realism has, has caught up with me. <laughs> um, so if, if I had had the time between RoboGames and everything else to put together these total how-to to get started with Raspberry Pi and Vision, uh, we would be here for the next three weeks going over it because there is so much potential to learn. Um, if, if there is interest, I personally am kind of a life transition I would love to teach classes if somebody would provide a venue and deal with registration and stuff like that. Um, Hacker Dojo. Right? Hacker Dojo will set you up. So, uh, talk to me. <laughs> uh, you know, it, as far as, you know, if you want to start with the Rabbi Pi, th this is stuff I tell anybody I bumped into. You know, A, buy your first set of parts US, you know, preferably from somebody who's been in the business for a while. Do not get cheap on your SD card. There are all these stories out in the world of people losing, you know, having having to rebuild their SD cards over and over again. And the people that I know are buying the high-end SD cards don't run into that problem, no matter how much we use our computers. Um, good power supply, you know. Although I, yeah, you know, well, on the platform I use RC batteries and RC chargers, but you can do an awful lot with all these crazy uh, USB battery packs. Um, uh, you know, um, among the problems of this whole universe is there are a million <coughs> questions that you get asked, you know, which distribution do you want to use? Um, and it takes a lot of people a long time to figure out at all what a distribution is. Uh, if you're doing robotics, it's Raspbian, unless you're doing Ross, in which case it's Maté, which is French for mate. Um, uh, and when you get your Raspberry Pi booted up the first time. It is a really nice computer that's really, you know, a better desktop than most of us had not very many years ago. Um, you know, then the real work starts. You know, everybody should learn VI, see all these tutorials, and they're, you know, afraid. <laughs> you have to get through it. Um, you have to learn, you know, the SSH family. To, it, you know, you, you need it to do anything at all and you have all sorts of capabilities if you learn these tools. Um, how to move files around from machine to machine to machine. You know, create a private key, um, and you have to put a passphrase on it or you're <coughs> being stupid. Uh, use Git. Um, uh, you want to lose many things in your life, you do not want to lose you know, five, six, seven, eight months of code. Um, you know, if, if you don't, 
care or you have to be public, put it on GitHub, they have free public repositories. If you choose not to do that, if you go to GitLab, they have free private repositories and charge for the public ones. Or, you know, it's kind of crazy. Uh, so I have accounts on both, and the stuff I want to share is on GitHub, and the stuff I don't is on GitLab. Uh, learn how to use screen, learn how to uh, create launch files for your environment. Uh, I've got two pies on here, running networks, access point, routers to my main network. Um, I can actually, you know, turn it on in the parking lot and drive it in here because everything boots up, um, uh, you know, correctly. Uh, programming language, why Python? I should have, I was just going to put a slide that said because it's the best. Um, uh, you know, I, I've been using Python since something like version 1.12, I think. Um, you know, it's just a really fast development environment. No <coughs> compile and link. I have an application that's about 80,000 lines of, uh, of Python code. If, if you uh, were on my website, and click search, and just before that had cleared out all the PYC files, you would have thought I had a very fast website, even though it had to compile these 40,000 or 80,000 lines, whatever it was of code, um, before it could begin to serve you. Um, just really easy to work with. You know, it's, it's a very modern language, you know, in some ways, whatever that means. It definitely has its quirks, uh, but to me, they're worthwhile. Um, the big thing, you know, in this world of vision is NumPy. You know, somehow, um, wouldn't have expected it 15 years ago, Python is replacing Fortran in, in, in many ways as, as uh, the scientific programming language for, for new development. Uh, there are Pythonic interfaces, uh, you know, for almost any hardware or software component you want to use. Uh, there's a very well integrated way to use it. You know, it's highly <coughs> portable. Um, I have a little CAD program that I use to generate stuff for my laser printer, and the exact same code runs under uh, uh, Windows, Linux, and, uh, and OS X, and you know, it's a fairly graphically intensive application. Uh, you can even run uh, uh, Python on iOS and a lot of, some microcontrollers as, as MicroPython. It's, it is, it's, it's quirky. Everything is an object, and that will surprise you often as to how true and consistent that is. Uh, they say it doesn't have pointers. You know, they say that is a good thing. It's not exactly true, which is even better. You know, there's this mutable, immutable thing, which you need to understand. Um, it takes care of pointers for you almost perfectly, but when it doesn't, you have to understand mutable versus immutable data types. Um, there are two active versions. Uh, this is another choice you get to make. Uh, if you are starting with Python today for the first time, you probably just go to 3.6. There are still a few things that haven't migrated to the newer world, even after these 10 years or so it's been going on. Um, but probably by the end of this year, nobody's going to start a new project under 2 because anything that matters will work under 3. Um, and then use this virtual and wrapper and pip to install things. Um, hearing this stuff and saying, I'm afraid of OpenCV, I can't do it, it's too hard, it's going to waste too much of my time. That was particularly true a couple years ago. Um, it has since not migrated to, I don't really know what the core, I guess there's a lot of C++ left, I think there's some Fortran in there, uh, but in a lot of ways it is now native Python, it sure looks like that, uh, when you, at least when you're working under uh, uh, Python. The image files are NumPy matrices. They're just a bunch of numbers. Um, and NumPy has great operations to deal with the matrices. Uh, and OpenCV essentially is just a bunch of math functions that deal with these matrices that happen to be images. Um, OpenCV is a math library. Um, and, and you have to live with that. Uh, I am kind of math challenged in a lot of ways, even though, even though I've studied a lot, I'm kind of slow at it. Um, but, you know, it's something you have to suffer through if you want to do vision. Um, you know, weirdness, you know, start looking around, you're going to, if you look at Python, you'll see CV dot whatever and CV2 dot whatever, and you know that the latest version of OpenCV is 3. Where's CV3 for Python? Well, there isn't it. CV2 is the latest a API. 
uh, which works with, uh, which was built for OpenCV3, and why they're different is who knows. Um, when you go searching for help on OpenCV, um, you will see lots of stuff for two dot series, um, which can be confusing because the <coughs> interfaces have changed a lot along the way. Uh, you'll see lots of C++ stuff, you know, which it's good to learn a little C++ anyway. Um, but prepare to be very careful, you know, there's this, the standard, you know, half of the stuff on the internet's wrong anyway, and then there's this whole world of confusion between the versions. Uh, another really fun thing is when you have your matrix, you know, three colors, uh, you know, and the, the native image format for no good reason is blue, green, red, whereas the whole rest of the world is RGB. Uh, and, but certain things within OpenCV are RGB. Um, so, you know, basically documentation is your friend. Um, here we've got a page. Uh, this is what OpenCV uh, documentation looks like. Lots of math. Uh, a, a, uh, it's a visual library that has essentially no images in the documentation. Um, you know, I, I have, I've got a son who looks at the matrix math there and says, oh, yeah. Um, and I spend like three hours, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I can kind of make it work. Um, uh, well, you didn't have a page that uh, dropped you down to references to to research papers to go look at to find out how it really works. Well, well there's that too. <laughs> um, you know, and there's just all sorts of information all over the place um, <coughs> at all levels of quality. Uh, you know, and at the end of the day, I, I think I would say it really is a research product, you know, and, and digging through, I, I am getting ready to rewrite some of the OpenCV functions for my own purposes, um, not because I have, you know, a fraction of the brilliance of the guys who wrote the functions, is I've got operational requirements. Um, actually, it's this next slide here, you know, the warp transform, very cool function. Um, the only way you can use it with standard OpenCV is to warp the entire thing, um, you know, which makes sense, but you know, it takes a certain amount of time. And when you only care about a fraction of the image and you've got a robot going 30, 40 miles an hour, um, you only want to work on the parts of the image you care about. Um, the challenge with all of this is that. Um, the documentation, all the discussions are amazingly non-visual. Um, you know, so what I've been doing, you know, for most of the last few months is building tools, and I'll show you some more of this. But you know, this year was one of my first attempts, entirely open CV, that it has a, a bit of a UI library with it. So these sliders and whatnot are part of the open CV library. Um, and I didn't understand all the math. So I, you know, I understood the basic idea and I started playing. So I created a slider for every variable. Um, and I created a tool that will generate the transform matrix. You know, and basically I had the image, which was taken you know, from this robot looking way down the field. And you know, the path is very distorted. You know, how far away is that curve? How sharp is the curve? Um, and when you look at it with your eyeball, you know, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of information there. But when you do the transform, you know, there, it's amazing what happens to single bits out on the horizon. And suddenly, you know, you can measure how long the path is and decide how fast you can go. Um, you know, here, there, there are two sets of two images taken in my living room. Um, uh, playing with settings of the camera, you know, this is another thing. There are a whole bunch of settings, very poorly explained, and generally kind of hard to test. You know, you edit some code, run it, look at the file, you know, I was wasting all sorts of time. Um, th this I thought was kind of curious, and uh, there are two sets of two. Uh, the first set was taken at um, um, ISO 100, you know, the old Kodachrome, uh, and we have this somewhat dark image, you know, where my uh, cube, this is actually what we're taking the picture of. Um, here I did not use? do the translation properly of RGB, that's why it's a blue stripe instead of a yellow stripe, but 
It was this box. Is this what you used in the tabletop navigation? Yes. Um, there, there is a function called, yes? The, the, what were the three colors you say most of it is written for now? Not RGB, but something else. BGR. Well, <laughs> OpenCV's default layout is BGR. Just, you know, just to drive you a little crazy, and for a lot of things it doesn't matter. Um, you know, there are lots of other formats. You know, R RGB is, you know, kind of our, we're, we're kind of used to that from monitors and mixing of the three colors. There's another one called HSV that gets used a lot, um, which is really cool in a lot of ways. It breaks out, you know, when you think, I want to select yellow. Well, what combination of RGB is yellow. Um, it actually it gets really hard to understand what's going on with HSV. Um, the three columns become hue, uh, which give you a, a somewhat more natural mapping. My bot uses that for its cone detection, by yeah, the way. I yeah, agree. it's very common for color detection to use HSV. And then you've got intensity and saturation. Uh, and you can see charts of how these permutate, you know. None of them are as easy as you'd like. Um, if you go hunting around, you will find, I think it was a Stanford professor uh, published this paper, you know, all these papers on OpenCV, uh, called Simplest Color Balance, which is just a, a couple lines of code, you know, surprisingly few, uh, that color correct an image. Um, and I found that because when I started using the camera was over this warehouse in Oakland, um, and I was using the wrong camera. I was using the, the Pi IR sensitive camera in this awful warehouse. So there's this terrible red tinge over everywhere, over everything. Uh, and I was looking for the white and yellow lines of the highway that was painted out on the thing, and I wasn't seeing anything. And color balance solved it. Uh, so it's one of the standard things with my toolbox. And so, you know, you can kind of see how it took my brown box and turned it to relatively white only you can't see it. Um, and so what happens, I have this black appearing image. I run it through color balance and it finds the cube in, you know, a not bad representation, you know, considering you started out with nothing visible to the human eye. Um, and part of the reason that is happening is anything you look at is being processed by about 35 different pieces of, of software. So you start, you know, your life, you know, photons hit the sensors, you know, in the camera. You know, there is software running in the camera um, that, you know, starts to turn that into an image. You know, in fact, you know, it's often explained that it's, you know, RGB uh, sensors in the camera. It's, well, actually, that's true, but they're more green than uh, the red and the blue because they're trying to match eye sensitivity to some degree. Uh, that gets translated into something, that gets translated. So when you're looking at this black image, you know, it may be that there is very little contrast in there. And this clever uh, algorithm went through and found the minor differences and created that. It may also be that, that you know, this is on my MacBook, you know, you know, oh, Apple just loves doing things for you. And they said, you know, that's basically a black image and if we showed a little ghost of something in there, that might upset you. Uh, so we're not going to show you the ghost, we're just going to turn it black. I mean, I, that is pure speculation, but what, <laughs> of exactly why it looks black, I haven't explored yet. But the thing to remember, every step of you're looking at, uh, there's multiple things going on. I, I read um, a few years ago when I was actually trying to decode um, I think it was, it was like the CMU Cam 2 or 3 is it really CMU Cam. Um, they had like a, a documentation on like how to decode, you know, how to read the, the raw values off of the, uh, and then decode it into it so you could make a yeah. decoded image. And their explanation for why it was BGR is it's actually B, like BGGRB because the size of the, the <laughs> sensors they have, like you said, you're trying to get more green for our eyes, um, and the size of the individual elements on the sensor, some are bigger than others, and so they pack in that way because that's the way that they can get, 
you know, that resolution is you pack these many sensors into this slab of silicon, and so that's actually why it's BGR. Uh, Perhaps I, I, I read an article which supposedly was quoting um, uh, one of the key committers to OpenCV, and and you know what he said. You know, maybe he was not being at all serious. Uh, that it's BGR for a similar reason to why American railroad tracks are four feet, eight and a half inches <laughs> apart. I, I can assume most people know that story, or I'll go after it, go yeah. on it afterwards. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there may have been a good reason, or there, you know, the may but not. At least, like, been. you know, for their class of sensors, or for, for maybe for maybe it's slightly easier. You know, one of the things that we forget, you know, is to transform something like that. I, I'm just amazed how much I can do on the stupid $50 Raspberry Pi. Um, it wasn't 10 years ago that you, you know, that would be a $30,000 machine to get the same sort of capabilities we're, we're you know, buying as toys. Uh, you know, so yeah, so it's hard to say. And there are things that are just, you know, they are somewhat arbitrary that are the result of some piece of hardware at that point in you know, it, it saved a couple ICs when ICs cost, you know, dollars or tens of dollars each. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so that's OpenCV. You know, I, I, I'm not sure how successful, but I, I've, I hope I am encouraging people to play with this stuff. Uh, you can really jump into it and do things. Uh, you can do a lot on a Raspberry Pi. You can do a lot on a desktop computer. I haven't done Windows for a long time, so I don't really know. Um, but everything I am doing runs equally on my MacBook under OS X and on the, on the Pi. Uh, I move modules back and forth. I try different configurations of the pieces of software. Um, so it, it's pretty easy to work any which way. In fact, you know, one of my projects for the next week or two is I've, I've got a module that handles the Pi camera and then feeds it into kind of a more general format is I'm going to build a module that can use my MacBook camera and then I can do more of the testing just over here. Uh, get a Pi, get, uh, get into OpenCV and amazing things are going to be done with, um, with vision um, over, uh, you know, the, the next short period. Um, one of the other groups that I'm involved in is this pipe warehouse uh, uh, kind of freeway racing that is going on uh, over in Oakland. Um, I joined that group a little, you know, late in their cycle, but they started last October. And at the first event, absolutely nobody managed to get through the course at all. Um, you know, and over, you know, at six months, maybe less than that, we've gone from multiple people um, uh, completing the course. Um, we were up at Thunder Hill running the races. We ended up with a, one of the kids with just a really good RC uh, driver. Um, and the robot cars were going almost as fast as he was. Mm. Um, and if you've ever seen a good RC driver, you know that's a pretty <coughs> amazing uh, capability. I don't know how they twitch their hands. We could keep track of which way is left as the car turns around. Um, just, uh, you know, quickly wrap up, you know, on my robot. You know, uh, you know, to, to, a, to a carpenter, every job requires a hammer. You know, I'm a software guy. Uh, everything is a software project, you know. So you can tell, you know, I have, I can justify it. You know, th this thing is ugly, found parts, partially because, you know, I'm still figuring out what I want. Uh, someday I will probably make it pretty. Um, but this has turned into a huge software um, project. I have wanted to do something like this for a long time um, and didn't get started for various reasons and partially every time I looked at Ross, you know, you know, I, you know, I, I, I started losing my interest. I shouldn't say that in this crap probably, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it is, Ross is a really cool idea that just seems so complicated to me. Um, that you know, I, I didn't know that I, I couldn't convince myself I want to do the work. I've now taken two classes, um, and it's still the same thing. I, you know, I can now make it do stuff. You know, I appreciate a little bit more why they did what they did, um, but you know, I think in a lot of ways it suffers a lot from being the first thing out there. Um,
but I've built operating systems and low-level drivers, and you know, I can do that. So that's kind of what I've been doing the last you know three or four months. Uh, I call it VNAV, Visual Navigation System. Uh, you know, the, the helmsman controls the chassis. I have never had a runaway robot. Um, uh, well, since the very earliest days, I'll say. Uh, but, you know, it is very help, fail safe. There are all sorts of things in, in the helmsman that deal with that. There's a cameraman that knows all about the camera and all of these um, uh, the image versions and whatnot, stand protocol. That will, you know, the, I, the, my goal is to, in not very long, um, have this running on my uh, BotVac um, and have the, the CPUs on little modular boards. I, I you know, I, I use this for tabletop because I never got anywhere near that far. Um, but my idea was that I would have th use the same controllers and just move them onto the small bot, connect them, uh, and tell it which platform it was on and it worked. So the, the idea is for it to be multi-platform, you know, transportable. Uh, Navigator is a path planner, very early, you know, engineer that filters the uh, the sensor information, and I've had really good results, um, uh, you know, at least at times. Um, I've got process manager. This, this is one of the things. When that boots up, you know, there are two Raspberry Pis. I want to connect to the network. I want to connect to this. Um, there are all sorts of strange things that happen. So I end up, I have this module that's looking at the system, and it can mount volumes, you know, so there, there's NFS um, bet between the uh, uh, between the, the two uh, Raspberry Pis for sharing files. Um, thanks to system D, NFS doesn't start reliably, so I've got component automatically restarts NFS. It, 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 it does the mount so the other thing can see it. Um, it's now starting to launch my own Module, so eventually everything will be out of the system startup files. It'll just be in my any. Um, the system manager is itself a node, uh, so I can send it a command and tell it to sh to shut down the computer. And not very long, I'm going to be able to ship it a file and say replace the current helmsman with this file, um, and then I won't have to SSH uh, in anymore. Um, because there's common code, I'm not doing all of this yet, but the loop of all of these things is supervised from the top level node. Um, at the bottom of that is a uh, capturing the, the traceback buffer. Um, you know, right now I'm just printing it, um, but eventually that'll get emailed to, to Mission Controller. Um, you know, the, there's also a, 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 a node uh, module uh, so, you know, I generally drive around using my iPad as just a, uh, a browser application. Uh, so I can move data around, you know, all over the world, basically. Uh, I have two applications. Um, sure, why not? Um, this is mission control. Um, as a there are some issues. I, I am doing everything the hard way to stress the system. So I am, all of my images are cross, coming across at the highest resolution um, as possible. Because uh, I figure if I can get that working smoothly, then go into lower things for, for lower bandwidth applications would help. Uh, this is mission control. This is how um, I started doing something. Um, there, there's a mission file that's in a directory. Um, and what I have loaded in there is my magic yellow line thing, which I don't know if it's working. Um, but <clears throat> so, um, so the app is not working. Where's my flashlight? Um, but you can see I'm getting images, you know, in real time of, of what's going on. The, the processor itself is actually, this is still kind of sluggish. I was just working on this uh, this morning. <laughs> we were very dangerous. Um, but, um, you know, I'm capturing, a, uh, I, I, I'm capturing about, I think, 18 frames per second. And all of those are written to the SD card. Um, uh, 
the next thing that I, and all of those are time stamped and sequenced so I can put them back together and get into the video if I, if I want. Um, I've got an archiver half done uh, that eventually is going to take all of the transactions that are going through MQTT and write those out to the SD card. Uh, so I will have a full logging system of the entire mission. Um, you know, you can see other buttons up there, you know, the very top corner, maybe not even visible. Um, uh, you know, I can set a, vi a, a mission name, you know, and change that, which, you know, creates a new mission file. Um, I can just drive around manually, click, mark waypoints, and it captures a current GPS waypoint and saves that out to the mission file. Um, and that's what I was using for testing for Robo Magellan. Um, you know, for various reasons, it's all camp fault for not giving us good uh, GPS coordinates no. that I did so yeah. far. <laughs> I won't mention anything about the cheese bowl. It's on yeah. tabletop. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, th th this is just a huge system that is kind of functional now. Uh, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it. You know, I, uh, it, it may become open source. You know, I'm kind of looking for work if anybody has... Uh, um, you know, I would love somebody to give me a, a little bit of money to help pay the rent and uh, support making it open source. Um, so this isn't using any open CV in it, right? Oh yeah, it absolutely is. Um, you know, it's just, a, you know, it's part of, you know, I jumped through the module, I, I've got a module I called Optic Chiasm, um, which is probably I'm pronouncing wrong, but it's, it's the nerve where, where the, the optic nerves come into the, the main part of the brain. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of functions that do transforms and stuff packaged up. Um, quickly, I said I was going to be done, but nope, let's get over here. So this is dark room. Um, which would be interesting if it works. Check that all out at you guys. Um, it'll take a couple seconds to, <laughs> to see whether it's working out. But it is asking the camera to take a picture and send it over, and there's some strange latency going on in here. Um, okay, so there you are. Um, so there is uh, the uh, original image. You know, there it's here. It's run through color balance. Um, here I do some cropping. Bill's shirt is orange there. Yeah, you know, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> there are all these settings all over the place. Well, he's a code. He's lucky the robot's not going 30 miles an hour at him. Um, uh, what happens here um, is uh, th there are a whole bunch of functions out here which are essentially OpenCV functions and higher level uh, functions. Um, uh, so if instead of doing the color balance, you know, of course it's being... Uh, so, so this is the GUI you've written, right? This is the GUI I've written that has a large collection and growing of OpenCV and higher, you know, conglomerate functions. Um, when you click, when I click into one, it changes it, this list of parameters to values. Um, so basically, you know, what I was doing is, you know, I had this whole, you know, structured system of take an image, try this, try this, you know, with parameters. You know, there are literally, you know, if, if you go on the web and say, you know, how to find a colored object, you know, say, well, run these five functions together. Well, each one of those functions has, you know, ten parameters which are not well explained and you, you want to explore. Um, you know, I've just spent hours and hours trying combinations, you know, and then you run it and then you have to bring up the browser to, you know, to find the file and look at the file. You know, with this, I can just play with it all in real time. Uh, and the way it's structured, you know, at the end, I'm not doing this yet, but, you know, this is all Python. So the OpenCV scripts are all exec files. So I, I'm, you know, do, you know doing a, a compile and run to fill in each one of these frames. You know, so I have the Python code to do that. All I've got to do is put it on a sheet of paper and export it. 
Um, you know, so at some point not too far down the line, once I have, gee, this processes this situation well, give it a name and send it to the robot and it'll have that in its repertoire um, for the next run. Um, you know, and up here I've got settings to play with the ISO and the shutter speed, um, which can all be done dynamically, you know, on the bot. So I'm working on features to look at the general lighting and adjust the ISO because everybody who's doing this understands <coughs> how sensitive um, uh, it can be, actually. Can you change?